In this video, I want to take a look at a couple of particularly interesting models uh, that we can investigate using the techniques um, that we talked about of linearizing nonlinear systems. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about a basically uh, the concept of population dynamics with a predator-prey type relationship and competing species type relationship, where we're looking at population growth models with more than one species present. Um, so we're going to look at two models. So we'll look at both of these models uh, of population dynamics. And again, population dynamics is just a fancy way of saying we're looking at growth patterns of different animals in different environments. So population dynamics. The first one is going to be competing species. Let's do that one first. Oops. Competing species. Um, in this case, there are going to be two populations. So do two different types of animals uh, compete for the same resources. All right, so maybe um, you know, deer and rabbits competing for vegetation uh, that they eat in a forest or something like that. So two different populations with that utilize the same resources and therefore have to compete over. In the predator-prey model, instead of competing over resources, uh, one of the populations is the resource for the other. So one population is the resource for the other. So maybe more like wolves and rabbits. So let's start with the competing species and just see how we could set it up. And then we'll look at how we can solve it, uh, or at least gain insight into the solutions using the techniques that we've talked about. So for competing species, start with that one. Okay, so we're going to have two species in some sort of closed environment. So there are two species in a closed system, some sort of closed environment. Nothing coming in, nothing going out. Um, and they're competing for the same resources. Okay. So basically, if we think about this, if we were to suddenly take away one of the two species, we should have something that looks exactly like the logistic uh, growth models from the beginning of the semester. So um, in the absence of the other, each should follow the logistic growth model from way back at the beginning of the semester. And so what that would look like is, let's imagine we have one population that we'll call x, the other population we'll call y. And you'll hopefully recall that the uh, logistic growth model looked like this. We had some constant, um, usually times, in this case, x times 1 minus x over some other constant that we called k. And I'm going to attach subscripts of 1 to each of these because this is just our first model for species 1, the one that we're calling x. Um, and similarly, we would have the same thing for y, but it would have some different uh, intrinsic growth rate and some different environmental carrying capacity. So these are what the two models would look like independent of one another. Right, these are both logistic growth. But now that they're both present, so if we assume that both are present, there has to be an interaction term. So the idea is that the population of x will grow proportional to some intrinsic 
you know, growth rate, how quickly that species reproduces, with some limiting factor, right? K1 is can be thought of as basically the maximum number of species X that can be supported in the environment. And similarly down here, um, K2 can be thought of as the carrying capacity for species Y, so the maximum size of species Y that can be supported within the environment. So if you want to think about it like that, we have some limiting factor. But if both species are present, neither one can reach their full carrying capacity because they're sharing resources with the other species. So when both are present, the limiting factor isn't just their own population uh, or their own population size, but also the size of the other population. So uh, growth is limited, limited not only by their own population size, but also the size of the other population. So we can account for this with an extra term. So our equations will instead take the form of the following. So we'll have our dx dt and our dy, let's write that a little nicer, dy dt. Uh, and it'll start off looking like what we have above. So imagine that I distribute through. So instead of writing it like this, let me just distribute through. And we would have R1x uh, minus um, R1 over K1 times X squared. Right. So that's what I'd get if I basically distributed through here. And then in addition to that, in fact, let's do it this way. I think this will be even cleaner. Let's write it like this. I'm going to write this as R. Sorry to be so wishy-washy here. Let's just write it like this. Let me factor the X out and keep the rest in. So basically, I'm keeping this X out, but I'm going to factor the or distribute the R through. So it'll be R1 minus um, some R1 over K1, which will be some new constant times X, minus some new constant that we'll call, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll replace this and just call it C1, and we'll have some other factor, B1 times Y. And similarly down here, we'll have something similar. I'll just call this R2 over K2. We'll call that C2 in a minute, minus B2 times X. So basically, if we clean this up, we've got X times R1 minus C1X minus B1Y. And for the second one, we have Y times R2 minus C2X, sorry, minus C2. There we go. Go back and squeeze this Y in that I forgot. And let me come back here. Erase this so I don't have this thing riddled with mistakes. Boy, there we go. Okay. All these uh, subscripts need to be two. All these subscripts need to be one. We've got the original terms. So basically this distributed through to this one and this one correspond to basically the same things we had up here and here. But now we have this additional term uh, that involves both x and y. So we've basically added in this coupling term where we have x times y. This is what makes it part of what makes this uh, nonlinear as well as the x squared here. And notice it's a minus sign because it should be detracting from the growth rate. The bigger y gets, the larger this negative number will become, and it's going to overall reduce the value that we have in here and ultimately reduce the growth rate of what we uh, expect to see over here. So basically, 
If you think about it, when we distribute the x through here, we'll get an xy term. When we distribute the y through here, we'll get an xy term. And this term at the end, the xy term, uh, can be thought of as kind of representing the interactions. of the two species, right? So essentially, imagine that these two species, your deer and your rabbits, um, meet up. They bump into each other in the forest, and they're both getting ready to eat the same patch of grass. Well, now that they have to share this patch of grass, each of them is negatively affected by the presence of the other. And that's why, again, the sign winds up being negative here. It's going to limit. So each, each negatively impacts the other. So this is what our uh, model is going to actually wind up looking like. Um, <clears throat> we'll do an example of this um, in a minute, but before we do that, I want to talk about uh, a predator-prey model and investigate what that looks like in, in contrast to this. So again, the big idea here is basically the xy terms, which represent the interaction of the two species, are negative in both equations. They negatively affect the growth rate of species x, and they negatively affect the growth rate of species y. Again, because basically when they meet and are competing for those resources, each has fewer resources uh, in order to, to survive on. If we look at the other model, the predator-prey model, it tends to be fairly similar. So like before, we have a closed environment. So nothing coming in or out. But now it's where one species eats the other. Uh, so basically, what this means is that one of the two species is, so basically one species, the, the predator, benefits from a large population of the other species, while the other species, the prey, is negatively affected by a large population of predator. So predators like a large popula population of prey, prey dislike a large population of predators. Um, and so the interactions become a little bit more mixed in this case, right? So uh, predators benefit from interactions, right? They get a meal out of it, while the prey is negatively effective, affected. Okay. Okay. So again, in the absence of the other species, um, we can either start with a logistic growth model or we could even do like an exponential growth model. You can kind of pick and choose. Um, there are existing models that use both. So uh, in the absence of the other species, we get basically you can pick dx dt is equal to, again, let's write it as the version where I've already kind of uh, distributed through here and swapped out a C in place of the R1 over K1, all that. So we can either get, here's our logistic growth model, or we could get dx dt is something simpler and just call it R1x. This is our exponential growth. So again, logistic or exponential. We can start with either of those as our base. Um, and basically you can use, you know, let's say that this one is the, this is the prey. Let's say X is the prey. 
So we can use either of our old existing models. And um, the predator, though, what would happen to the predator in the absence of the other species? So dy dt, imagine that in the absence of the other species, what's going to happen? So if there's basically, so imagine there's only two animals in, in this environment. There's wolves and there's rabbits. In the absence of rabbits, what's going to happen to the wolves? So why is our wolves? Well, they're going to die off. They don't have any food to eat, and so we will get a negative exponential decay. Right? So, so whether you want to think about the rabbits as being exponentially growing or logistically growing, the point is, in the absence of predators, the prey do just fine. They grow and they have some either equilibrium uh, population they approach or they grow exponentially without bound. On the other hand, again, this is the predator. On the other hand, the predator in the absence of prey will just quickly die off. Um, it has nothing to eat. So if there's both populations present, we expect some additional interaction term. So when both are present, Basically, you know, one animal, in fact, let me not even say this. When both are present, the prey is hurt by interactions while the predator benefits from interactions. Right? When the rabbit and the wolf meet, the wolf has a good time, the rabbit not so much. And so remembering that our interaction terms were the terms where basically x and y were multiplied together, right? these xy terms represented interactions, a negative coefficient indicated a negative impact, and a positive coefficient will indicate a positive impact, this means we're going to have, have two possible um, setups. So we get, depending on, again, whether we choose to use the logistic or exponential model for our prey. So we're either going to get um, dx dt equals, so let's do the case where it's uh, logistic growth. It would look like the r1 minus c1x minus b1y times x, so that's basically the equivalent of what we had right here. I've just written the x on the end because I forgot to write it at the beginning. So basically this one looks the same. Here's our interaction term, the x times y term, and again it's negative from interactions. And this portion, neglecting this b term, would be the model for logistic growth. And alternatively, we'd get d, so let's do that, or dx dt, if we just did uh, exponential growth, we wouldn't get anything that looks quite like this. We'd get an r1x, and then we'd get minus b1y times x. So it simplifies the model, basically. Um, we can either just get, oops, and I've added in an unnecessary x there, so it should just be r1. It's hitting multiplied with this x out here. So here's the other possible model. So just r1 minus b1y times x. Basically, we've just taken out this term, which is the limiting factor, or the, um, excuse me, the carrying capacity term that limits growth for logistics. So this would be the logistic version. So this is our logistic prey. This is our exponential version of prey. You pick one or the other, and it goes along with dy dt. So again, not both. So let me make it totally clear. Pick one of these two, and it goes along with the one for the uh, predator, which we've already seen looks like negative r2 times y. So there's our negative r2 times y. It just dies off, exponential decay. 
but it benefits from interactions with the other species, in this case, x. So we have a plus b2x, and this sign is important. Negative here, because the prey is negatively impacted by an interaction with a predator. Positive sign here, because the predator is positively impacted by an interaction with the prey. So this is the, again, predator. And that's what you're looking for, to decide which one is predator, which one is prey. You look for those signs. Um, you could do something clever and try to model something like a symbiotic behavior where each species is positively impacted by interactions with the other. Um, so in that case, you could modify it by just switching both of the interaction terms to be positive terms. There's other types of behaviors that could be modeled with very simple modifications to the equations. So again, remember... The xy terms represent species interactions. And the sign of those terms determines whether the species benefits from those interactions or is negatively impacted. Okay, so there we go. So let's take a look at a, at a model. Uh, and I'll just make one of the two up. We don't have to, I'm just gonna write one of them down and um, you can try to decide, I'll ask you, what type is it? And then we'll go through the math of it. The math tends to be pretty similar, um, but it's kind of nice you can start to get some insight into what you can expect the population dynamics to look like. So let's do an example. Oof. And you'll decide whether it is a predator-prey or competing species model. Um, so let's say I've got the following model. Let's say it's dx dt is equal to x times 1 minus x minus 0.5y. And the other one is dy dt equals um, y times negative 0.5 plus x. Okay. So here's our model. Which does it represent? Well, the main thing that we should look at is the interaction term. So if I were to distribute the x through, this is the term that involves x times y, and it's a negative sign here. So this species x is negatively impacted by an interaction with species y. Down here, if I were to distribute the y through, this term xy with a plus sign would be the interaction term because it's positive. This uh, species y benefits from interactions with species x. So this is a, based on that, predator-prey relationship. Um, it's even possible to modify this part and change this to be like a logistic growth. Maybe there's, maybe it's an omnivore. Maybe the it's not wolves. Maybe it's, I don't know, bears and salmon or something like that. Uh, right, The salmon are negatively impacted by the bears. The bears are positive, positively impacted by the salmon. But on the other hand, bears won't die off entirely if the salmon are gone because the bears also eat insects and berries and whatever else they can find as, as omnivores. So we could even modify this term um, and have it just not be immediate die off in the absence of the other species. But in this case, this looks more like a wolves and rabbits situation where if we take away the interactions, then species Y is just going to die straight off. Basically, let X be zero, let there be no rabbits, and species Y is going to follow suit, and there's not going to be any wolves pretty soon. So this is a predator-prey. Predator-prey relationship, again, based on the interactions, based on the XY terms. So let's see if we can actually try to figure out how to get a sense of what the behavior is going to look like. 
So this is a nonlinear system. What we want to do is find the critical points and linearize. So we need to find all the possible critical points for this situation. Um, if I'm calling this over here my F and this right here my capital G to coincide with the notation that was used in previous videos, um, <clears throat> I need the critical points to be where basically dx dt is zero and dy dt is zero. So basically where my F, this whole thing is zero and my G is also zero. So the critical points are where f equals g equals zero, so that our rates of change, our population growth rates, are both zero. The population is unchanging. It is steady in these situations. OK, so we, <clears throat> looking at it, have basically the same kind of four pieces that we had in the previous example we did, right? We have an x times some big, in this case, trinomial, and we have a y times some binomial. So I'm going to start off by saying x equals zero which will ensure that dx dt is zero and see what implications that has for y. Then I'll set y equal to zero, see what implications that has for x. Then I'll set this term equal to zero and see what implications that has and set this term equal to zero and see what implications that has. So basically we have sort of four different things to go through. So let's start by assuming x is equal to zero. If x is equal to zero, that automatically ensures that f is equal to zero. Right, if x is equal to 0, it's sitting right here. This whole thing is what I'm calling f. We have 0 times. doesn't matter what this is. The whole thing for f is going to be 0. But what does it tell me for g? g is going to take the form of the following. So g, when x is 0, it just looks like negative 0 0.5 times y. So we get negative 0.5, or rather y times negative 0.5. And that tells me the only way to force that to be 0, right? we want to force that to be 0, is to force y to also be 0. And so this gives us our first critical point, which is the origin, 0, 0. Um, now let's try and see what happens if I force y to be equal to 0. So if I force y to be equal to 0, then g is automatically 0. Whoa. Right? That means this lower equation, by setting y equal to 0, it doesn't matter what this term is. The whole thing, g, is automatically going to be 0. And f will take the form of the following. It's going to be x times 1 minus x minus 0. Right? Because I plugged in y for z or 0 for y. That's killed off this term. But this whole piece still survives. And if I want this to be 0, there's two ways to make that happen. Either x can be 0. So basically, what we've got is that x times 1 minus x equals 0. And that implies that either x equals 0 or x equals 1. And this gives us one critical point that we already knew. We already knew y equals 0 and x equals 0. The origin was a critical point. But it gives us a new one that we didn't know. y equals 0, x equals 1. So we have a second critical point. x is 1, y is 0. So we have two critical points so far. Let's see if there's any more. So the next thing I'm going to do to make things easy, let's save this one for last because it's kind of the ugliest. Let's do this one. I want to force this to be 0. So I want basically negative 0 0.5 plus x to be 0. Negative 0 0.5 plus x equals 0. If I force that term to be 0, again, it ensures that g is automatically going to be 0. Uh, but it's also going to have an impact on f. What is it going to do for f? Well, keep in mind, another way to write this is that if negative 0 0.5 plus x is 0. What it's telling me is that x is equal to 0 0.5. And so that's what I need to plug into the equation for f. Let's plug in 0 0.5 in place of the x. So I've got 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5y. And I want that to also be 0. Right? I want both f and g to be 0. So I've plugged in the value of x. 
that setting this equal to zero gave us, right? Setting this equal to zero gave us x equals 0.5. So I've plugged that into the other one and I've come up with this. Uh, this 0.5 out here doesn't make any difference. The one minus point, right? It's multiplying this number. The only way to make the whole thing zero is to make the stuff in the parentheses go to zero, right? We can essentially divide both sides by 0.5 if we want to, or double the whole equation if, if you want to think of it that way. But if I simplify what's in the parentheses, I get 1 minus 0.5, which is 0.5, minus 0.5y, and that has to be equal to 0. And so what is the value of y that would make this statement true? y equals 1. If y is equal to 1, this will be true. And so now I have another critical point. I have that when x is 0.5 and y is equal to 1, both f and g will also be 0. So we have 0 0.5 comma 1 as another critical point. And the last thing we would do is check this final term right here. Let's set this equal to 0 and see what that implies. So 1 minus x minus 0.5y equals 0. So 1 minus x minus 0.5y equals 0. That automatically ensures keep my notation consistent, that automatically ensures that f is 0 because we've basically just set one of the two factors in f equal to 0. But what impact does it have on g? So on g, well, I can come over here and we can basically solve for x in terms of y or vice versa. Um, this ensures, if I were to solve for this, that if I were to solve for x, by moving the this term and or well hell let's just move the sorry heck let's just move the x over to the other side so if I move the x over to the other side we'd have x equals one minus 0.5y so x equals one minus 0.5y and so I can replace in g anywhere that x shows up I can replace it with one minus 0.5y. And that's what we're going to do here. So let's take a look at g. g is y times negative 0.5 plus x. But we just saw that x is 1 minus 0.5y. And now I have this equation entirely in terms of y. We want it to be equal to 0. So let's take a look. We've got y times, if I were to simplify this, I've got a 1 here, a negative 0.5 here, which is going to give me a 0 0.5, so 0 0.5. And I have the minus 0.5y, and that's equal to 0. So that's just combining this and this term together and simplifying. And now this product has to be 0 implies that either y equals 0 or, uh, let's see here, or y equals 1. So y equals 0 will make this 0. y equals 1 will make the whole thing in parentheses 0. Gives me those two values. And if I come back to here, letting y be equal to 0, if y is 0, then x is 1. And that gives us the point 1, 0, right? So this one means x equals 1 and gives us the point 1, 0, which we've already got. This one, when I plug in this, so if x is or sorry, if y is equal to 1, what would x be? So take our value y equals 1. Plug it in here, 1 minus 0.5 would be 0.5. And our second point that we get out of this is 0 0.5 comma 1, which is, again, a, re a repetition of one that we've already found. So this didn't yield any new ones. It uh, made us find two that we already happen to know existed. So in this case, looking at what we found, there are three critical points. They are the origin, 0, 0. We found that up here. Uh, the point 1, 0. And the point 0 0.5, 1. OK. So there are our three critical points in this case. Um, <clears throat> typically, in a predator-prey model, you'll usually wind up with three, especially in the case that we allow um, the predator to die off, right? If it's not the omnivore bear, but is instead the wolf and it can die off, we'll wind up with three. 
if we allowed the bear to, you know, if we change it to a bear where it can survive without the prey, we would actually probably wind up with four critical points here. It would add a little complication to this term here, and we would wind up with four critical points. Um, and we can talk about that in just a minute. We'll talk about why does it make sense to get this many critical points in the context of the actual problem we're dealing with. But for now, let's just figure out how to solve this. The next thing we need is the Jacobian. So we need the Jacobian in order to linearize. So our Jacobian J, let me just remind you, it's F sub X, F sub Y, G sub X, G sub Y. And for us, with the particular f and g that we've found here, uh, if I were to take the x derivative of this, a lot of times it's easier to write these out. So let me just remind us. Uh, we'll write it over here. Give us a little extra room. Just let me write down what f and g are so that I don't have to keep scrolling back and forth. And let me write the form where I've distributed through. So let's distribute the x through here and make it a little easier to compute this derivative. So I'm gonna get x minus x squared minus 0.5xy, that's our f, that's this with the x distributed through, and the bottom one distributing that y through, we get negative 0.5y plus xy. Okay, now I can zoom in and we can actually do this. So here's the f and the g just copied from up above, but distributed out uh, or expanded out. What is the x derivative of f? So the x derivative here, I will get one minus two x minus 0.5y. So one minus two x minus 0.5y. That's just this one term. Now we need to take the y derivative of f. It only shows up here. Y is only shows up in this one location, so it's negative 0.5x. There's the coefficient there. What about for g sub x, the x derivative of g? Well, here's the only term where that shows up, so we're going to get a y there. That is the partial derivative, right? Again, we're just treating the other a variable like a constant when we take these derivatives. That's what these partial derivatives are, same as we've done in the past. And the last one, g sub y, we're taking derivative with respect to y. x is now the constant, and so I'm going to get negative 0.5 plus x. And that is my Jacobian in general. And now we're going to evaluate the Jacobian at each of these three points making the appropriate um, substitution in terms of like what our u and v look like. But at the end of the day, we don't even really care about all of that. But let's take a look at the Jacobian. Oops, that's an ugly j. There we go. It's still pretty ugly, but good enough. Let's look at the Jacobian at the origin. So at the origin, right, we're going to get a system that looks like some sort of, right, we've got our d, dt, of u and v equals, I'm plugging in 0, 0 into our Jacobian here. So 0, 0, when I plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, I'm going to get a 1, 0, 0, point, negative 0 0.5. So 1, 0, 0, negative 0 0.5 times u and v. In general, I'm going to basically stop writing this part because I kind of know at this point in shorthand, all we care about is what this matrix winds up looking like because the solutions uh, we find for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors come from just dealing with this part of it, right? Just the matrix that's sitting here. So that's all I really care about. Um, this is going to give me, when I try to find the determinant of a minus lambda i, setting it equal to zero, what we're gonna get is a one minus lambda, zero, zero, negative 0.5 minus lambda, which gives me a one minus lambda times a negative 0 0.5 minus lambda equals zero. And that tells me that lambda is either, either equal to one or negative 0 0.5. They're real and distinct. I know this is gonna give me a saddle. Um, and we plug in now to find the eigenvectors. So here are the eigenvalues. Let's find the eigenvectors associated with these. So I, in this case, want a minus lambda i times our vector that we've been calling k equal to zero. Let's do it for the lambda equals one case first. 
if lambda equals one, that matrix looks like zero, 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 and what do we get? Negative 1.5. And we're trying to multiply times our k1 and k2 to get zero, zero out of that. And this is going to give us that this first eigenvector is going to be, the first one doesn't give us any restrictions, the second one tells us k1 can be anything, k2 has to be zero. So I'll just pick one zero to make life easy. All right, I can pick anything for the first one up here because it's getting hit by the zero, I'll just pick one. The k2 is getting hit with this negative 1.5, so for the whole product to add up to zero or that dot product to add up to zero, k2 has to be zero to kill off this term. If we do the other one, lambda equals negative 0.5, then our matrix looks a little bit different. We are going to get positive 1.5, 0, 0, 0, times k1, k2 equals 0, 0. And this one tells us that k2 needs to look like, in this case, the top equation tells me the 1.5 is going to hit the k1. That means the k1 has to be 0 to kill that off. And k2 can be anything we want. So let's just call it 1 to make life easy. So here are my two eigenvalues and their associated eigenvectors associated at the origin, so at the point 0, 0 at that critical point. So that's going to give us one little sense of behavior. We're going to have a saddle at that point, uh, and we'll draw that into our diagram in a minute. But let's find the behavior at the other point. So what was the next critical point? So let's do 1, 0 next. So the Jacobian at the point 1, 0 uh, looks like the following. So again, I'm just going to not even bother to write these parts. We kind of know this is what our system's going to look like. Imagine that we basically let u and v be the shifted version. We're now centered at the point 1, 0. And I just care about what that Jaco Jacobian matrix looks like right there. So at that point, um, our Jacobian matrix is going to be, let's see, where's our generic one? Right here. So I'm plugging 1 for x, 0 for y. So 1 for x, I will get 1 minus 2 minus 0. So I'm going to get negative 1, negative 0.5, 0, and positive 0.5, I think. So let's write that down. What did I just say? Let's just write out 1 minus 2 minus 0. That's this top term when I plug it in. This one will be negative 0.5. Bottom will be 0 and negative 0 0.5 plus 1, which equals negative 1, negative 0 0.5, 0, positive 0 0.5. So there is our Jacobian matrix at the point 1, 0. And so same thing, we'll find our eigenvalues. We'll do that by doing the determinant of a minus lambda i and setting it equal to zero. So for us, that determinant looks like negative one minus lambda, negative 0 0.5, zero, and 0 0.5 minus lambda. We do our multiplication to get negative one minus lambda times 0 0.5 minus lambda minus this product is convenient because they, I've got a zero down there. I'm just going to get a zero from that. So that's supposed to be equal to zero, and that tells me that lambda is one of these two terms has to be zero. So lambda either has to be a negative one or it needs to be 0 0.5. 0 0.5 will kill off this term. Negative one will kill off this term. And so again, two real distinct eigenvalues. We've got another saddle in this case. Uh, so we've got a saddle at this point as well. Let's take a look at what the eigenvectors look like here. So I need to find a minus lambda i times the associated vector and set that equal to zero. Let's take a look at what happens when lambda is equal to negative one first. So when lambda is equal to negative one, my a minus lambda i matrix will be zero, negative 0 0.5, 0, positive 0 0.5, times k1, k2, supposed to be equal to 0, 0, and 
either one we want to pick, the top equation or the bottom, we will get that k1 can be anything, k2 has to be 0. So let's call this vector 1, 0 to make life easy. So again, you can just check, plug that in here, and ensure that when you do your multiplication, you do indeed get 0, 0. This one will work. The other one we need is lambda equals 0 0.5. When I plug that one in, I'm going to get negative 1 minus 0 0.5. So what is that? Negative 1.5, negative 0 0.5, 0, and 0. K1, K2 equals 0, 0. So in this case, the second equation doesn't tell me anything, so I have to use the first one. And we can use our old faithful rule here. In this case, swap the order of the two and flip a sign. So I would do 0 0.5, negative 1.5. There's one example. And if we decide we want to get rid of the decimals, I could just um, double both of these and get 2, negative 3, that would also work. Uh, and again, that's all we're looking for here. Did I get that right? No, no. I needed to double that. It should be 1, negative 3. I'm sorry. I misdoubled it. So again, double it to get rid of decimals. Doubling 0.5 gives me 1. Doubling this gives me negative 3. And we could again plug that back in and verify that indeed it does solve uh, this equation right here. So here are the two eigenvectors associated with this saddle. We'll draw those in and take a look. But before we do that, let's get our last point. It was 0.5 comma 1. So I want the Jacobian at 0 0.5 comma 1. So what is that one going to look like? So my matrix... Again, I'm just plugging into our generic Jacobian matrix, which we have right here, 0.5 for x and 1 for y. So when I plug in 0.5 for x, I'm going to get 1 minus 1 minus 0.5. Uh, 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.5. In the top right, I'm going to get, what is it? negative 0.5 times 0.5, so negative 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. Bottom left will be just the value of y, so 1. Oops, 1. And then bottom right is negative 0.5 plus x, and x itself was 0.5, so negative 0.5 plus 0.5 is whatever, I'll write that down. When we simplify, we get negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.25, 1, and 0. So there's the Jacobian matrix for this case. Okay, I think I got all those correct. So let's Again, find the eigenvalues. Find the eigenvalues by setting the determinant of a minus lambda i equal to 0. And so for us, that determinant is going to look like this. Negative 0 0.5 minus lambda, negative 0 0.25, 1, and just a negative lambda down there. Do my multiplication. I'll get negative lambda times negative 0 0.5 minus lambda minus negative 0 0.25, which is the product of these two. And that's supposed to be equal to 0. Let's clean this up a bit. If I distribute through, I'm going to get lambda squared, that's this times this, plus 0.5 lambda, plus 0 0.25 equals 0. So there's what that one looks like. Um, we can do the problem like this although I don't really like dealing with these decimal coefficients, so let's make them whole numbers. Uh, if I multiply everything by 4, if we multiply everything by 4, I'll get 4 lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 1 equals 0, and that's a little nicer to apply the quadratic formula to. 
If I apply the quadratic formula to that, I'm going to get that lambda is equal to negative b, so negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 4, minus 4ac, so 4 times 4 times 1, over 2a, 2 times 4. So what do we get out of this? That's negative 2, plus or minus 4 minus 16, so negative 12. Square root of negative 12 over 8, which is negative 1 fourth for this real part. I can factor a 4 out of here, and once I pull it out of the square root, it'll become a 2. And then I'll have a square root of 3, a negative 3 inside, so it'll be plus or minus 3i with the 2 on top canceling with the 8 on the bottom, I should get plus or minus 3i over 4. That's what that simplifies to. Uh, square root of 3, my bad. Square root of 3i over 4. Okay, so there are my eigenvalues. Just write it a little nicer. Negative 1 plus or minus root 3 times i over 4 indicates it's complex. It has a real part, and that real part is negative. And this tells me I'm going to get a spiral out of this, and it's going to be a decaying inward spiral because the, the uh, real part is negative. And so we'll just need to figure out whether that um, spiral is going to be inward or sorry, we know it's inward. We just need to know if it's going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. So I don't even need the eigenvectors at this point. Once you find that it's a spiral, we're just going to be drawing it. So as far as the eigenvectors go, we don't care. We do care in the case of like a saddle or one of the nodes um, that we talked about earlier, but we don't care in the case of something where we get complex eigenvalues. We know it's a spiral. And so we don't really care about the eigenvectors. They don't play that big of a role in drawing the shape of this. So let's get our phase diagram now. So let's look at the phase diagram. And remember, this whole thing started as a problem that was a predator-prey problem. So we're looking at interactions of x and y, where x and y are the population sizes of our two species. So we have x and we have y. x, you'll recall, was the prey, and y, you'll recall, was the predator. Okay, we had three critical points. One was at the origin, so we've got that one. The next one, I think, was at 1, 0, if I remember correctly. Yes, 1, 0. So let's say that we're counting by halves. This is the point 1, 0 0.5. Same thing going up this direction, 0 0.5, 1, and our last one, so we've got two of the critical points, 0, 0, 1, 0, and the last critical point was 0 0.5, 1. So 0 0.5, 1 is right up here. So there are my three critical points. In the neighborhood of each one, we know what the phase diagram should look like. So at the origin, we found these were the two eigenvectors associated with these two eigenvalues. So let me zoom in and try to draw this a little bit. Our eigenvectors go in this direction and in this direction, vertical and horizontal. Right? One was 1, 0, 1 was 0, 1. These were the two eigenvectors. The 1, 0, so that's the horizontal one, is associated with the positive eigenvalue of 1, while the vertical eigenvector, 0, 1, is associated with the negative eigenvalue of negative 0.5, which tells me, because the vertical one was associated with the negative, we're going inward in this direction, and because the other one was positive, we're going outward. And so basically, we're getting a picture that looks something like this. We can draw on these pieces to kind of draw our saddle. And keep in mind, I'm drawing them kind of in all the quadrants here, but these ultimately represent populations of predator and prey. I only actually care about the first quadrant. These other three quadrants are non-physical. They represent negative populations. So we don't care about the behavior here. I'm going to draw it in anyways. 
But for us, the model really only is interested in what's going on in the first quadrant where the populations are zero or positive. Okay, so this is the behavior going on here. Let's check out the behavior at the next critical value, which was the point one zero. So at one zero, here we go. Here's our two eigenvectors. So one was one zero, so one was horizontal. That was associated with a negative eigenvalue. And one was not, it wasn't horizontal, it wasn't vertical, it went in the direction one, negative three. And it was positive, associated with a positive eigenvalue. So let's draw in those eigenvectors and the directions associated with them. So we had one that was one, zero, so that's this direction. It was negative, so everything's going towards that. And the other one was one, negative three, I think. Yes, one, negative three. So I need to go basically one over, three down, so it's basically a steep-ish line going in roughly this direction, and it was positive. So it means we're going out here. So this is also a saddle, meaning that my curves, solution curves, should look something like this. And again, I'm drawing them down here, uh, but these parts of the solution don't really matter. We only care about the solution here in the first quadrant, again, because those are the physical values. If we were to track this upward, we can see that it's kind of leading over here towards the last critical value that we're interested in, which we know is a spiral, right? And it's an inward spiral. We just need to figure out, so here's my spiral. Does it look like this? Or does it look like this? Right? It's going to be spiraling inward. We just don't know if it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. So let's think about, in the vicinity of this, let's go to a point like above it and figure out what's going on in this spiral. So let's go to a point that would be like sitting up here and figure it at this point relative to the critical point. Are we going left or are we going right to figure out the direction? To do that, we come back to the Jacobian matrix for that problem. And remember, the Jacobian matrix is telling us the velocity, du and v, right? So we've got this is what that equation would look like if we were to write the whole thing out, right? So I mentioned back in the first one, here's what the system looks like, but we, for all intents and purposes, aren't going to really care about these parts. We're just going to look at the matrix itself. But down here, it's important to write that in and think about the interpretation. You can think of this as basically sort of a velocity vector. And in this case, it's going to tell us which direction we should be going when we draw our spiral, left or right. And so let's plug in a point above the critical point. So we've recentered, and keep in mind, by recentering in terms of the u and v variables here, this centered point, the origin, so to speak, in this system, is at the point uv equals zero. u equals zero, v equals zero is this point, right? Even though it's at the point x equals 0.5, y equals one, the whole point was when all of these, we always change to a new set of variables that recenters the critical point at the origin in our new variables, u and v. So we don't need to try to pick a point out here that's like the number 0.5 and a number bigger than one to get up here. All I need to do is pretend this is the origin. What's a point Im immediately above the origin? Let's pick the point 0, 1. So I'm going to plug in the point 0, 1 above our critical point, basically. So <clears throat> if I plug in 0, 1, what would we get for our velocity over here? So if I plugged in 0, 1, so basically I'm suggesting, let's get rid of these and plug in zero and one and see what we get. I will get negative 0.5 times zero, negative 0.25 times one. So I'm gonna get negative 0.25. Then let's do y, one times zero, zero times one, zero. So this times this plus this times this is zero. So this is what I'm getting. 
what direction does this point? So remember, this is sort of our horizontal direction and vertical, right? Horizontal, vertical. Let's come back and draw. In our diagram, we've gotten something where the velocity is negative in the horizontal direction, meaning to the left, and zero in the vertical direction. So basically, at this point above it, we expect this thing to be going this way. And if we're going to the left when we're above the critical point, our spiral must be going this direction. It must be going counterclockwise, right? So we've got that this is to the left from above, which implies counterclockwise. So that's all this CCW stands for is counterclockwise. CW for clockwise, CCW for counterclockwise. Let me just write that in, counterclockwise. OK, so there's what that tells us. And that tells me I have an inward spiral, inward because the real part is negative, and it's counterclockwise based on that analysis that we just did. So let me draw a spiral that's spiraling inward going counterclockwise, or spiraling inward in this case. And now we just kind of play connect the dots, and you can kind of get a sense of what's going on here. If I were to continue this one up, it could kind of, you could think of it as joining that spiral. And you could think of, for example, what's going on here as being maybe even part of a spiral. What happens if you started over here? Well, maybe you start over here and you come all the way down and like hit one of these, and then it takes you over to here, and then it turns you all the way back around and spirals you on into the answer. And so we can kind of get a sense of probably what the behaviors are going to be looking like. Similar out here, it has to go up here, and eventually it's going to wrap around and join these loops. And we can get a sense of what the overall behavior is going to do. And now we can try to interpret it in terms of, so what is the interpretation? or interpretations from all of this. Um, <clears throat> so one thing we know is that if we're at one of these critical values, we're at that critical value. We're never going to leave it. So what does it mean if I start at 0, 0? If, the, if, if I'm at the critical point 0, 0, what does it mean in terms of my populations? What that tells me is that I have 0 bunnies and I have zero wolves, right? 0 predators, 0 prey. If I start off with 0 of both, I'm never going to change. I'm never going to move away from zero of both. But what if I move slightly off of it? What if I move to right here? At this point, I have a small amount of prey, right? I'm on the prey axis, but I still have zero predators. So if I have a small amount of bunnies and no wolves to prey on them, what's going to happen? Well, they will just follow this line, logistic growth, up to right here. They will make it to their carrying capacity, at which point there is still, notice this is still on the axis, so there's still zero predators. No predators have magically appeared. And we reach our maximum carrying capacity of prey, uh, which was one. So anywhere along here represents no predators, only prey. If we start at zero, we're going to stay at zero, but if we're a little bit above zero, we'll eventually move over to our carrying capacity. If we start over here, we're above carrying capacity in terms of the prey, but still no predators, the population should drop down to the carrying capacity. So that's what happens on this axis. What happens on this axis? So on this axis, there are no prey, but there are predators, right? Wolves, but no bunnies. So if I start up here with a population of one, and there's no wolf, or sorry, one wolf, no bunnies, what's going to happen? we're going to die off and go to the origin. There still won't be any bunnies, but there also won't be any wolves pretty soon. Uh, if we move to any of these other points in here, right, some combination of predators and prey, what we'll see is initially, so let's say, imagine we started over here on this line. We have a fairly large number of predators, but very few prey. What should happen? A lot of wolves, no, very few bunnies the population of wolves should die off. And as that population of wolves dies off and there are fewer predators, well, then there's less wolves to eat the bunnies. And so the bunnies 
should be able to start to reproduce and grow in population. And as they grow in population, they'll eventually get large enough that there's a plentiful amount of prey and you would expect to see the population of the predator start to go up. There's lots of food for the wolves to eat because now there's lots of rabbits. And it'll go up and you'll see this uh, amount of prey start to decrease, right? I'm moving slightly to the left. So the prey is decreasing while the amount of wolves is increasing. And then we get to kind of and repeat this cycle, right? Too many wolves, not enough rabbits. So the wolves die off, the bunnies grow, then the wolves start growing and start killing off the bunnies. And then we repeat and we cycle in. And this point right here, this critical point, is the balance where basically the predator and prey are in equilibrium. But what you would expect to see out of this is oscillations in populations, right? We're seeing basically, if you think about it going from left to right, right? Small amount of prey, then it increases, but then it starts to decrease, then it increases, then it decreases and increases as we circle into this critical point. So we see oscillations in the amount of prey, and we're seeing the exact same thing happening in the vertical direction with the predators. We see oscillations in population. So on x-axis, the interpretation is no predators, logistic for the prey. On the y-axis, the interpretation is no prey. What happens to the predators? Predators die off. And at any other points, all the other points wind up yielding a an oscillation, an oscillating behavior of increases and decreases. In the populations. And in fact, this is absolutely observed in actual populations. We see these fluctuations um, of different species, and we see that when we suddenly reintroduce wolves to an area where they're extinct, right? If we're on this axis where there are no wolves in Yellowstone, they reintroduced wolves, and they suddenly went from basically this stuck large amount of, of the prey that they eat, they went up and they saw a die-off and then they saw a large growth in the wolf population, but then it eventually evened out, sort of went through these cycles and eventually approaches an equilibrium where nature's kind of in balance. So this is the idea. You need to be able to break down a big problem like this. It's a lot of work. You've got to find all the critical points. Once you have the critical points, you need to find the Jacobian. You need to evaluate the Jacobian at all of the critical points to basically find the local behavior in the region of that point, whether it's a saddle in terms of the phase diagram or a spiral. And you'll start to see the same types of things show up. If you're dealing with a, uh, another um, predator-prey model, you're going to see the same types of behavior here. Um, and, it, and it's going to make sense. For example, at the origin, you're going to always find that these eigenvectors are going to be one is basically one zero and the other one is zero one. They're vertical and horizontal because they ensure that by going on those eigenvectors, having them on those axes, you aren't accidentally crossing from positive population into a negative population. So you'll always see that. Same thing if you have an equilibrium point over here. It, at least one of the eigenvectors is going to be on the axis to ensure that none of these solution curves can cross the axis from positive population to negative population or vice versa. So there will be things that you can kind of look out for that will make sense once you try to interpret them in the context of thinking of this as a population dynamic model. Um, so give that some thought. Uh, I've given you one big problem kind of similar to this um, for your homework. Obviously, these problems are involved and time-consuming, so I'm only giving you one of them. Uh, but let me know if you guys have any questions about this stuff, because it's, in my opinion, one of the coolest topics that we are going to see.